Okay, you got it? This story quickly, which is the combined wealth, this is according to Oxfam, of the world's 85 richest people is equal to the three and a half billion poorest people. It's fantastic. And this is a great thing because it inspires everybody, gets the motivation to look up to the 1% and say, I want to become one of those people. I'm going to fight hard to get up to the top. This is fantastic news. And of course I applaud it. What can be wrong with this? Yeah. Yes, really. So somebody living on I celebrate a capitalism. dollar a day in Africa is, is getting up in the morning and saying, I'm going to be Bill Gates. That's the motivation the everybody needs. The only thing between needs. me and I'm that guy is the motivation. I just need to pull up my socks. I am oh, not wait, don't, I don't have socks. Look, don't tell me that you want to redistribute wealth again. That's never going to happen. All, okay? You know what? You take a simple stat like this, which is neither good nor bad. It's just a fact. It's a celebratory stat. I'm very excited about it. I'm wonderful to see it happen. I tell kids you know every day, just if to, you... I'm just gonna, if what's wrong with this? Up at a cocktail party. No, no, Amanda, one what's wrong with this one statement? One possible response If you to it, work hard, you might be stinking rich We're talking about people in extreme abject poverty. That's how you get three and a half no, billion No, we're not. You were just talking about really category. rich people. No. Okay, so that was Kevin O'Leary, a Canadian businessman and probably someone you would not want in charge of the world. And... Those were his ideas on human motivation. Um, he claims that money is what motivates people and especially the prospect of being among the world's top percent richest, uh, which unfortunately seems to be quite a common worldview today. But is that true? Um, in, in Zeitgeist Spirit, we're going to look at what the actual evidence says, uh, because as we, as, we as we obviously know, um, majority opinion or common sense sometimes turns out to be incorrect. Um, so, um, first some uh, psychological experiments uh, which, uh, which actually say that rewards can reduce already existing motivation. Uh, in a 1971 experiment, Edward D.C. had students assembling puzzle cubes, uh, first without rewards, then for money, and finally without rewards again and he observed them secretly, what they were doing in, the, in their free time. And he noticed that uh, in their free time, they would happily play with the puzzle cubes. Uh, however, after the reward condition, and when rewards were removed, they would work on the puzzles less. They suddenly had less motivation to work on puzzles. Um, another similar experiment was done with children who had an intrinsic interest in drawing. This means that they like to draw for its own sake, just for the fun of it, not because of any ex external motivation. And then some of the children were given a reward certificate on the condition of continuing to draw. And afterwards, they showed less interest in drawing than those who never got any rewards, and also less interest than they themselves had had at the beginning. And the researchers called this effect over-justification. If you give an additional reason to do something that is already interesting, that makes people think that the task is not worth doing without the rewards. So in other words, the focus shifts from doing the task to just getting the reward. Uh, now you might say that, well, motivation isn't that, isn't that important as long as things get done and things get done well. And obviously offering rewards should make people try harder and get better results. Uh, so Sam Glucksberg tested this with a simple puzzle. Participants were given a box of tacks, a candle, a matchbox, and they were told to attach the candle to the wall. Can you think of how you would do this? Uh, half of the participants were told that they would receive a monetary reward if they were among the quickest to solve the problem. Uh, this is a simplified version of the puzzle that was given to another group of participants. Uh, there is one crucial difference, the box of tax has already been emptied, and in this version the puzzle is really easy to solve. Uh, so, uh, the results showed that for the first task, which is more difficult and required some creative thinking, performance suffers if rewards are involved. This could again be that the focus shifts from the task to getting the money, or they might be getting too excited about the bonus reward. 
On the other hand, they did do better in, in this version, in, in, in the simple one, when they were offered rewards, um, because this, the, the task is really easy. Uh, so it would seem that it's okay to keep, pe keep paying people for simple manual tasks. However, as you all know, this is not very relevant anymore because you have things like self-checkouts and self-driving cars. And in some places in Asia, you even have robot restaurants. And these are just the sort of... And well, um, so all that's left for humans to do are the mentally demanding creative tasks such as uh, building and maintaining those robots. And these are the sort of tasks that Glucksberg showed are hindered by the promise of rewards. And in case you're wondering whether increasing the reward amount might work, uh, there was an experiment done by Dan Narielli and colleagues in rural India uh, where they could offer the participants money that to them was worth a year's salary. And they found that performance suffered most when they were offered the biggest amount. So perhaps when all you can think about is what you're going to do with your big bonus once you get it, you might not get much actual work done. Um, one thing that all these experiments had in common was that a tangible reward such as money or a reward certificate was offered on condition of the participant doing something. And even the biggest critics of this line of research agree that this is one condition where performance does suffer. Um, so what should we do while we're in a system where you, where you do need money to live? Dan Pink, in his book Drive, suggests that companies should pay their employees well and unconditionally so that the issue of money would be off the table and they could focus on their work. And the same idea could be applied to whole countries, which is what the proponents of basic income are suggesting. Uh, they believe that if you provide everyone with enough money to cover basic needs, then people would still continue to work. They would work on what they love doing because of people's natural desire to make the world a better place while being stuck in an unrewarding job just for the sake of being alive more often hinders their ability to do so. Uh, this is similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs idea, uh, that um, there, are some, there are some basic needs, but once they're taken care of, and people have security about their job, house, and so on, they can focus on higher needs, which are relationships, self-esteem, and self-actualization. But if there is uncertainty about the future, then that uh, prevents the individual from achieving their true potential. On top of this pyramid of needs is self-actualization, which, which essentially means contributing something useful and lasting to society, which is quite a different view from those who think that people only want to work when externally incentivized. Um, back to the idea of basic income. So what happens if people's basic and security needs are taken care of? Uh, thankfully, this experiment has been carried out a few times in the world. Here's an early example from Canada. At that time, North American governments were quite enthusiastic about the idea. They were even thinking about expanding this all over the United States and Canada. Uh, so this uh, pilot project was run from 1974 to 78, 79, uh, but unfortunately stopped due to a recession and all the data from the project was archived because the government thought it had failed. Uh, but they were finally discovered and analyzed in 2009. And the results were quite interesting. They showed minimal effects on employment. Uh, the only groups that worked substantially less were new mothers and teenagers because, well, taking care of children and studying are very important. And also, as a result, graduation rates went up also, people had more opportunities to choose the sort of work they were doing. And very importantly, hospital visits went down and mental health improved, which actually saves the country some money. Uh, a more recent pilot study was carried out in a small settlement in Namibia in the years 2008 and 2009. Uh, the results here were real dramatic. Uh, when at the start of the experiment, food poverty levels were at 76%, then they went down to 16. Uh, so essentially, people didn't have to worry about food anymore, and they could have stopped working at all. Uh, but to the contrary, employment actually went up by 10%, because people now had money to start their own businesses, and they had money to buy from those businesses. 
Uh, this shows how even a small boost to resources uh, helps people put them to good use, rather than increasing dependency on the free money, which the critics were predicting. Uh, in addition, parents could now pay their kids school fees, so school attendance doubled, and dropout rates went to almost zero, uh, which was largely because the, ch the children were no longer malnutritioned. Also, crime, went, crime rates went down by 42% because people no longer had to steal from each other. Uh, unfortunately, though, the Namibian government uh, isn't planning to make this nationwide, even though they, there, were, there were calculations that it would only cost 3% of their GDP. Uh, however, there's a government somewhere in the world where it might be possible. Uh, in, in Switzerland, there is still the old tradition of direct democracy, and they hold regular referenda on major issues. Uh, to propose a referendum, you need 100,000 signatures, uh, which is what the proponents of basic income have done. Uh, the votes will be held in the next two or three years, and it would, it would be an interesting experiment to see. Would the Swiss people become desensitized and stop working? The evidence so far suggests that probably not, uh, but if if the evidence so far has not been enough. There are plenty of more examples. And in addition to all of these, uh, various statistics show that between 30 to 50% of people volunteer at least once a month. And remember, all of this happens while they still have day jobs. Uh, so after all these examples, you might be wondering, what is it then that motivates people? I'll give you four theories, which, are, which probably all have, some, uh, have a lot of truth in it, and there's a bit of overlap. Um, first of all, there's the Maslow theory mentioned before. Then there's uh, DC and Ryan self-determination theory, uh, which um, lists the elements as competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Um, and l large emphasis is on autonomy, being able to choose what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and who to do it with. And uh, they say that this also expl explains the previous experiments because um, getting someone to do some, something for a reward is essentially a form of control. Uh, it's trying to control the people's behavior by offering them something that they really need. Um, and often in workplaces, also the other uh, needs for autonomy are not covered because you don't often have the choice of what sort of work you do or how. Uh, however, in some more progressive workplaces, uh, they do try to increase autonomy. For example, Google gives employees 20% of time to work on whatever they want, and from this you have things like Gmail and Google News. Also, post-it notes were developed by the stationery company 3M uh, by letting the employees come up with whatever they wanted. Uh, Dan Pink slightly modified the three words, and his version is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And we'll come back to mastery and purpose on the next few slides. Finally, Alfie Cohn, in his book, Punished by the Rewards, uses three Cs, collaboration, content, and choice, uh, to which you could possibly add challenge. Uh, he also quotes this fellow named Hertzberg, who said, if you want people to do a good job, give them a good job to do. And idleness, indifference, and irresponsibility are perfectly valid responses to absurd work. <laughs> this is from the film Office Space. Uh, so, coming back to mastery, uh, there's a theory by a Hungarian psychologist with a ridiculously difficult name, which I'm not going to pronounce. Um, he describes a state of optimal experience called flow. Uh, which means that you're completely immersed in your task. You almost lose sen sense of the passing of time, and you even forget if you're hungry or thirsty. Um, kind of like the quote by Isaac Asimov, nothing interferes with my concentration. You could put an orgy in my office, and I wouldn't look up. Well, maybe once. Um, according to the theory, the state of flow will be reached if the difficulty of task matches the person's skills. So if the task is just a little bit challenging, because if it's uh, too easy, then it will be boring. If it's too hard, it will produce more anxiety than anything. 
And studies show that this state is three times as likely to happen at work than in free time. And also people are often happier in workflow than in leisure activities that do not produce a flow state, such as watching TV. Uh, which creates quite an old paradox because people sp still spend an awful lot of time watching TV. And this brings up an important point that people often don't realize how much they can enjoy work. And they think that work must be boring just because it's work, uh, which is an attitude worth, worth challenging. Um, the importance of purpose is pretty much self-evident. If you, have, if you have a purpose, then you have a reason to do something, and then you, you must have motivation to do it. Uh, but as we said about common sense before, it's still worth looking at it scientifically. Um, Dan Narielli has tested this uh, with um, experiments with Lego Bionicles and paper shredders. In the Bionicle experiment, uh, participants were instructed to put together Lego Bionicles and they were paid decreasing amounts of money to do it, but everyone was paid the same. However, there were, there were two conditions. In the first condition, as soon as they built a bionicle, the experimenter would take it apart again. In the second condition, uh, the bionicles would stay there and the participants could see all the previous bionicles they had built. And in the second condition, they built on average more bionicles than in the other condition. Also, with paper shredders, they, they, did a, they did a task on paper, and then in the first condition, the experimenter would um, acknowledge the work they had done, scan it in, and put it in a pile. In the second condition, the experimenter ignored what they had done, just put it in a pile. And in the third condition, they ran it through a paper shredder. As you can guess, in the third condition, uh, the participants lost their motivation quite quickly, whereas if their work was acknowledged, then they had more motivation to do it. In fact, having to do a pointless job is so unpleasant that it has actually been used as a punishment. Uh, first, in the Greek myth of Sisyphus, who as a punishment had to roll a boulder up a hill, but as soon as he almost reached the top, the boulder would come down again and he had to, he had to start over. And in the real world, uh, it has been used in prisons, where prisoners had to dig holes and fill them up again. That was before the institutions realized that they could actually profit off the prisoners by making them do real work. Uh, so it's no wonder that many people in today's jobs lack motivation and hate going to work every day. Because there are so many jobs that simply don't seem to have a purpose. Sometimes jobs we could even do without, such as sandwich board advertisements. Um, uh, but often jobs are even created for the sake of creating jobs, just because of the way the monetary system works, or malfunctions more like. Um, sadly, though, sometimes the most purposeful jobs don't even pay you a single penny, or if they do, then they pay you much less than the other jobs. But on the bright side, people do them anyway. Uh, so what I would like to leave you with is a few ideas on what to do with all this info. Uh, first, obviously, you can use all these examples whenever someone claims that without money nothing would get done which is something we all probably hear a lot. Uh, secondly, I'd like, to, I'd like you to ask yourself what motivates you. What is it that you do in your free time that's, that you feel has a purpose, that fulfills you, that challenges you? And if there isn't anything like that right now, maybe you can think of something that you could be doing. Uh, because often it's best to lead by example and that would also be you could also be yet another contribution to the growing evidence that people do things just because of intrinsic motivation, not because of money. And finally, you could ask your friends the same questions. What motivates them? Would they still be working if, it, if a resource-based economy happens or if they receive the basic income? Or would they just sit on their couch all day? Um, well, after all, even Kevin from the beginning video, um, should be a picture here. Um, oh. oh, there we are. Even Kevin from the beginning video is occasionally intrinsically motivated. <laughs> Thank you.